it's been a few days now, but last Thursday, we introduced this concept of electromagnetic radiation, which we defined as pure energy, pure energy that travels in a wave-like form. Does anybody remember what causes electromagnetic radiation, or as we often abbreviated, EMR? Yep, Emma? Good. Accelerating charged particles cause electromagnetic radiation. Now, you might have a charged particle that's at rest. That'll produce something, but not EMR. What kind of field would that produce, a charged particle at rest? Field or fields would it produce? We know for sure it's going to produce one kind, right? The obvious one. An electric charge will produce what kind of field? Yep, Bo? An electric field. Will it produce a magnetic field? No. So therefore, it's not going to produce EMR, right? Uh, now we've got a charged particle that's moving. Will that produce an electric field as well, Bo? Good. Yes, it will. Will it produce a magnetic field? Maria? A charged particle that's moving, will it produce a magnetic field? Yes. That's good. So it's got an electric field and a magnetic field. A charged particle that's moving at a constant speed, will it produce electromagnetic radiation, Daniel? No. But if you've got that charged particle that's moving, I don't know what symbol that's supposed to mean, but we'll, we'll pretend that that means accelerating. Okay? An accelerating charged particle, then that's going to produce an electric field. It's going to produce a magnetic field, but both of those fields will be changing, and therefore it will produce electromagnetic radiation. What does EMR consist of? Well, we just kind of said it, right? The changing electric field and the changing magnetic field. If this is our, our axis here, our xy axis, then you've got a, an electric field that's like this, perhaps, and then you've got a magnetic field I'm trying to draw it here, I'm trying to draw it. You got a magnetic field on the z axis that looks like this. Okay, this electric field right here produces this magnetic field right here. Okay, this magnetic field produces this electric field, and so on, and so on, and so on. So they end. This electromagnetic field, this electric field and magnetic field, the electromagnetic field becomes self-propagating. After the initial changing electric and magnetic field were produced by the accelerating charged particle, then the fields, the electromagnetic radiation as we now call it, moves or propagates from one place to the other. It moves this way, right? So if you've got one field on the x-axis, one field on the z-axis, then it's going to move along the y-axis. In this case, you have one field on the y-axis, one field on the z-axis. It's going to move along the x-axis. So it's caused by accelerating charged particles. It consists of changing electric and magnetic fields, which end up causing each other. The cycle repeats itself, and the wave ends up moving from one place to the other. Who was it that, that came up with this whole theory of electromagnetic radiation? I tell you guys sometimes, like, listen, don't remember any more than you have to remember. Don't memorize any more than you have to memorize. This is one you just got to memorize. Okay. James Cork Maxwell, remember his last name, Maxwell, came up with the whole idea of, of accelerating charged particles, the idea that it consists of um, changing electric and magnetic fields. Anybody remember the speed of EMR? Yeah, three times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If you don't remember that, this is one of those things that I do remember, but not because I try, not because I'm trying to memorize that number, just because I've used it so many times that at some point you're just going to remember it, right, by accident. It's on your data sheet. Okay, check your data sheet. Okay, um, I think it's in the middle of your data sheet, I think. Um, and you're going to find the speed of light, it says, 3.00. Actually, it's on the left-hand side, I think. 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That means that the speed of any kind of electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum or in air, slightly slower in air, actually, than it is in a vacuum, but it's not that much slower to three significant digits, it's still going to be 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. To more digits, it would be slightly less, but to three digits, it's the same value in air as it is in a vacuum. All right. Uh, finally, we talked about... Um, 
four different wave properties exhibited by electromagnetic radiation, right? We talk about this, this whole wave theory. We talk about this particle theory. Which is it? Is it a wave or a particle? Well, right now, right now, we're saying it's a wave. We're saying it's a wave because it exhibits these properties that are exhibited by waves. Okay, the first one was refraction. That was the bending of light. Remember the soldier analogy? Okay, when you went from one medium to the other, the direction of the, of the wave changed. Okay, well, the direction of light changes when it goes from one medium to the other. That's why I can see right now through my glasses. Okay, if light just enters my eyes, goes, goes back to my retina, I'm not going to see anything, just a blur. But when I put lenses in front of my eyes, it bends the light to the point where it focuses right on my retina. Uh, and then I'm able to see so this glass, or this plastic as the case may be, bends light. It ref light refracts. Refraction is a property of waves, so light must be a wave. Another one we talked about was diffraction. That was the spreading out of a wave. Okay, there's, a, there's a little barrier and a little hole in that barrier, and the wave goes through the, the hole, and then it spreads out. Okay, it doesn't bend, it spreads out. Yeah, that's a property of a wave, but light undergoes diffraction, therefore light must be a wave. Next one was interference. When a crest hits a crest, you get a bigger crest. When a trough hits a trough, you get a bigger trough. When a crest hits a trough, they cancel out. Constructive or destructive interference. That's a property of waves. When, when a a crest of, a, of light hits another crest of light, we get brighter light. When a crest hits a trough, we get cancellation. Light undergoes interference as well, just like waves do. So light must be a wave. You guys remember the fourth one? Fourth one's the one we did the little demonstration with those little dark filters. It's the one where we you go to see a 3D movie. Okay, You have these two filters, one on each eye as you go in to see the movie. Maria? Polarization, good. Polarization was that idea that we filter out, we can filter out all but one component of light. So if you've got, um, if you've got, or, or waves in general, if you've got light that's, uh, the electric field, the magnetic field is always perpendicular to each other. Okay, but it may look like this, or like this, or like this, or whatever. Okay, all kind of different crazy configurations, but always at 90 degrees to each other. You get a polarizing filter, maybe it allows only this through, or maybe it allows only this through. It, it filters out everything else. It's polarizing it along one axis. Okay? That's a property of waves, but since light undergoes polarization, then it's got to be a property. It means that uh, light's got to be a wave as well. All right, this is. Uh, this is what we spent some time watching a video on Thursday. Didn't show you the video on Friday, but uh, we'll show it to you again today here, just to refresh your memory in just a moment here. Let's see, though, if before I show you the video, if you remember the seven types of EMR in order. Okay, remember this song again. What's first? Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, good, x-rays, good. X-rays and gamma rays. Good. So it looks like this. As we go from left to right on that spectrum, the frequency is increasing. We start off with a low frequency. Frequency goes up as we go further to the right. So radio waves have a really low frequency. Gamma rays have a really, really high frequency. Um, energy, same deal. Okay. Uh, we start off with a low energy with, uh, with radio waves, and we end up with a really, really high energy with gamma rays. And then finally with Wavelength, it's exactly the opposite. As frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. That's because of this equation, right? You guys remember that from physics 20? V equals F times lambda. If we rearrange this to solve for lambda, we get V over F. V is a constant. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So if F goes up, and this is a constant, then what's going to happen to lambda? Lambda is going to go down, right? As one goes up, the other one goes down. That's because frequency is on the bottom in that equation. Now, the last thing we did on Thursday was to identify how each, how specifically 
each of these types of EMR are produced. We know that they're all produced in general by accelerating charged particles, but specifically, how are they produced? Radio waves and microwaves. Remember, these are the easiest ones to produce. That's how I remember this one. Hey, radio waves and microwaves, they're first on the list. They're the easiest to make. How do you make them? Just get an electric charge and move it back and forth. Okay. AC current in our houses generates very, very low intensity, but still generates radio waves. Oscillating electric charge. Okay, that's a big word, but all it means is charge is going back and forth, back and forth. Which basically means AC current. Infrared, visible light, ultraviolet. You might have a little bit of an advantage on this one if you've taken chemistry. They're all produced by, by what? You got an atom. Electrons can jump to a higher level if they absorb energy. But they can also fall to a lower level. And when they do that, when they fall to a lower level, they give off energy. That energy that they give off is always in the form of EMR, one type or another, infrared, visible light, or ultraviolet, occasionally x-rays, but it would have to be one heck of a transition to be x-rays. So usually we just say it's these three types. Now, different transitions produce different frequencies. And that's why we say all three of these are produced essentially the same way, just different transitions. So we're going to label that as transitions of electrons in atoms. And we don't just mean any transition, right? It's not a transition from a low to a high level. It's always falling from a high to a low level. We'll talk more about that uh, when we get to our last unit and spend some more time on the Bohr model of the atom. X-rays. X-rays. You accelerate these electrons to really, really, really high speeds, like 10 to the 7 meters per second. And then you smash them into a metal target. You stop them almost instantly. You rapidly decelerate those electrons. The electrons had kinetic energy, but it's got to go somewhere. So as they rapidly decelerate, the kinetic energy is transformed into photon energy, light energy. So we're going to say for the, for the x-rays, rapidly decelerating electrons. And then finally, gamma rays. You guys remember this one, right? This one becomes the cool one back when we, when we actually studied this in more detail in our last unit. Gamma rays are produced by not something as boring as transitions of electrons in an atom or AC current, alternating current, or oscillating electric charge. Yeah, Bo? Good. We're talking about nuclear decay here. We're talking about a nuclear reaction okay, where the nucleus of the atom does something. Not where electrons surrounding the atom does something. That's boring. That's chemistry. Okay? We're talking about something happens in the nucleus itself, and the nucleus changes into something else. What ends up happening is you know, something crazy happens in the nucleus. The nucleus is left kind of excited. But then when it goes back down to its normal state, it gives off this gamma ray. Okay. It's excited. It gives off a gamma ray. It just celebrates, right? Celebrating fireworks, except the gamma ray is uh, the firework here. All right, so I got some good news and bad news for you at this point. What do you want first? Bad news first? All right. Everybody always asks for the bad news first, Tom. There are seven types of electromagnetic radiation. You have to be able to identify any one of these seven types of EMR by frequency, by wavelength, or by energy. In other words, and there's a range for them as well. It's not one particular frequency for each type. It's a range of frequencies for each type. So in other words, you have to be able to identify 21 different numbers. 21 different number ranges here. Radio waves are this range of frequency. They're this range of wavelength. They're this range of energy. Visible light, this range of frequency. This range of wavelength. This range of energy. 21 different ranges of numbers. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is, you have me as a teacher now, as opposed to, say, 
17 or 18 years ago. Because 17 or 18 years ago, I would have said, sorry, guys, got to remember it. Now, we still have to remember some of it. But in the end, there's not very much that we have to remember. I'm going to give you a little, a little cheat to figure out what the frequency and wavelength and energy of all these types of radiation are. It occurred to me one day, it was quite a while ago, but wasn't when I first started teaching. It occurred to me that if we remember uh, visible light, it's 4 times 10 to the 14, the 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And we remember that microwaves are 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 hertz. And we remember that x-rays are 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 20 hertz. It occurred to me that that's all we really need to remember. Of 21 different number ranges, we can get all of them from these three numbers. For instance, let's say you get a question on an exam that says, you got this, this EMR has a frequency of 5.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. What is it, by the way? 5.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz, what is it? The numbers are up on the board right now. You guys got to get this. 5.5 times 10 to the 14 is going to be what kind? Visible light, right? It falls right smack in the middle of that visible light range. We get another one that's 6.5 times 10 to the 19 hertz. What is it? It's an x-ray. We get another one that's uh, 3.2 times 10 to the 10 hertz. What is it? Microwave, right? You get another one. It's 5.5 times 10 to the 13 hertz. What is it? Infrared. You didn't need to know the range of infrared. You got the range of microwaves and you got the range of visible light. If it falls in between those two numbers, what's it got to be? It's got to be micro or, uh, inf infrared, right? So let's remember these three different ranges of frequencies. And there's no, no way around that. Okay, we got to memorize these three different ranges of frequencies. For the other four frequencies, all we've got to do is fill in the blanks. If it's 10 to the 22, it's gamma rays. If it's 10 to the 16, it's ultraviolet. If it's 10 to the 7, it's radio waves. If it's 10 to the 11, it's microwaves. If it's 10 to the 19, it's x-rays, and so on. If you ever get that question, whether it's one of the ranges that we've memorized or not, then what I think you should do, what I'm telling you you should do, is write out the spectrum like we have right here, and then write out the frequency ranges of each of those types of EMR. And if it's something in between, just fill in the blank. All right, well, we got 21 things to remember. Seven frequencies. We got seven wavelengths. And then we have seven energies. We've got the frequencies taken care of simply by memorizing three different frequency ranges. So. We're good here right now. Okay, of the seven things that we know right now, we only had to actually memorize three, less than half. For wavelength, you need to remember even less. Because for wavelength, what you should do is calculate frequency. Let's say you're given a wavelength of, let's say, um, 6.0 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. That's my wavelength. You're looking at it and saying, I have no idea what kind of EMR that is. No idea. And I didn't memorize any of the ranges of wavelengths. How am I going to determine what kind of EMR that is? Calculate the frequency. Say, F is equal to V over lambda. Okay, that's from our wave equation that we learned in physics 20. V is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And lambda is 6, in this case, times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Do the math there. It works out to be 5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. What is it? What is it if it's 5 times 10 to the 14 hertz? Visible light. So we didn't need to memorize the wavelength ranges. All we do when we're given a wavelength and asked to determine what kind of EMR it is, all we got to do is calculate the frequency. So we now have 14 things taken care of, 7 wavelengths, 7 frequencies, and all we have to actually memorize is three different frequency ranges.
Energy can be determined in a really similar way as we just did frequency, sorry, as, as we just did wavelength. I'm not going to give you the equation for that yet, because it's not going to make any sense to you yet. There's a variable in there that you've never heard of before. That will come later in the unit. Okay, but for now, just trust me that if you have the energy, you can calculate from the energy the frequency, just like we calculated the frequency from the wavelength. And then all we have to do is compare it against the three frequency ranges that we remember. So, we've got 21 different things that, honestly, there's going to be some kids in the province, some grade 12 students in the province, that are memorizing 21 different frequency ranges. Okay? You're going to memorize three. And then you're going to figure out the other 18 of them, if you need to, from those three. Got it? If you're anything like me, listen, I can remember these three. That's not a problem for me. But if I had to remember 21 of them, I would be still, still 20 years into the teaching this, I would still be hooped. I would have, I would not get this question. If I had to memorize 21 different things, I would not get that question on the exam. But if I only have to remember three, then I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. All right, this is our, uh, our last thing here. We've established the theory of electromagnetic radiation put forth by, by uh, James Cork Maxwell. But there was no proof when James Cork Maxwell come up with his theory to to show that his theory was correct. I mean, we have these four properties of waves that electromagnetic radiation exhibits. Right? Refraction, diffraction, interference, polarization. That's still not proof that Maxwell's theory is correct. The idea that accelerating charged particles cause EMR and it consists of changing electric and changing magnetic fields. So along comes a guy named Hertz, whose name you probably recognize, Heinrich Hertz. The unit for frequency is named after him. It's named after him because he did a lot of work with electromagnetic radiation, which is a wave and has a frequency, right? So it's not a coincidence that he did this experiment. He used what we call a step-up transformer. You don't really need to know what that is, um, or at least how it works. Bottom line is, it changes the potential difference from a low value to a high value. So over here, we've got a low value of V, and over here, we've got a high value of V. The reason we want a high value of V is because we want electrons to jump across a gap here. We've got a gap where the wires don't connect. We want it to arc. But it's not going to arc if we have this really, really small voltage. It's going to arc if we have a big voltage. So we increase its voltage to a really big value. So increase its potential to a really big value so that the electrons will jump across this gap. Over here, Hertz has got an antenna set up, which basically just amounts to a loop of wire. Now, his idea was this. Okay, he said Maxwell, Maxwell's theory included the idea that accelerating charged particles generate EMR. These electrons, as they jump across the gap there because of a really, really high potential difference, will accelerate. So, if Maxwell's theory is correct that accelerating charges generate EMR, and these electrons are accelerating across this gap, then all I should have to do, Hertz says, is detect EMR to prove that Maxwell's theory was correct. Right? If accelerating charged particles produce EMR, and I've got accelerating charged particles, and I detect EMR, then the theory must be correct. So, He's got this antenna, which is meant to detect electromagnetic radiation. He fires this apparatus up. He accelerates charged particles across the gap there. All of a sudden, in the antenna, an electric current is produced. Hertz said, great, I just I did it. I just verified Maxwell's theory. Why? Because an electric current was produced in the antenna? Yeah. What will cause an electric current in a wire? That's what this antenna is, right? A wire. What will cause an electric current in a wire? 
We learned about that in the last unit. A changing magnetic field, right? We said uh, a magnetic field that's moving or a wire that's moving, but we said the third thing is a magnetic field that's changing. So we've got, when this electron goes across this gap there, this accelerating charge generates a changing electric and a changing magnetic field. That's going to generate a current in the wire if, in fact, it is a changing electric, a changing magnetic field. If it's not, then you're not going to get a current in the wire. We got a current. It told Maxwell, sorry, it told uh, Hertz that there was a changing electric and magnetic field. It told him that there was electromagnetic radiation produced there. If we didn't have it before and now we do, then it must have been caused by the accelerating charge, which is exactly what Maxwell predicted it would be caused by, the accelerating charge. So he's just proven Maxwell's theory correct. It consists of a changing electric and magnetic field. We know that because it was detected by the antenna. Right? There's an electric current produced in the antenna. And it was produced by an accelerating charge, because that's the only thing we got that we didn't have before, when we didn't have EMR produced. Now, the kind of EMR that he detected wasn't gamma rays or anything crazy like that, not even visible light or ultraviolet or infrared. It was radio waves. He called them radio waves. He gets to name them because he's the first guy to experimentally detect them. Why were they radio waves that he used? Not because he said, uh, you know what, I think I'm going to use really, really low frequency. That'll work better. No, it's just because it was easier. How do you generate radio waves? Oscillating electric charge, an AC current. Well, it was a lot easier to use, to use an electric current that was oscillating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, than it was to have some kind of nuclear decay process or even transitions of electrons and atoms. So it was by sheer convenience that he did what he did right, with the oscillating electric charge, which, not by coincidence, produced these low-frequency waves that he named radio waves. Does that make sense? OK, give you a chance to write that down now. All right, here's what your homework is for tonight. I get to work on page 647. Number one to two, five to nine, and 11 to 14.